beautiful voices at that. Oh, good. Oh, it's a bopping one. Do we need that? Bop. There's a river flowing in my soul. There's a river flowing in my soul. a special time and it'll happen before service and she's going to teach us some tricks about reading music. Kevin taught me a trick up here and if you look at the um, on page well on the first part of the song towards the end and it's telling me it's not and it's telling me that and it's telling me those notes with the holes in them that means you slow it down, you slow it down. And then ah, it's a mystery what happened at the end, but Diana will tell us another time. It has something to do with that little number three on the second page. Sing this section several times at the end. But there's no test today, you all passed. Yeah. Okay, good morning everyone. And welcome to Universalist Unitarian Church of Farmington. My name's Kevin Smith, I'll be your service leader this morning. I am uh, currently serving as uh, the VP of Finance, part of the executive board here at, uh, at the church. So I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors today. Please join us in the lower level after the service for coffee hour. Uh, give you a chance to meet our, our members as well as uh, have any questions answered. We'll have someone from our membership committee down near the visitors table for you to talk to if you'd like. So at this point I'd like to invite any first time visitors who are brave enough to stand and let us know where you're from and how you heard about us. We'd like to meet you. Any brave souls? Okay. So uh, if there are some out there, just uh, so you know, during the service, we have supervised nursery for babies and toddlers and religious education classes for children and youth. Uh, please see our religious education coordinator, Natalie Case, here, if you have any questions or you need more information. And should, should you need to leave the service for any reason, there are two other locations in the building where the service is broadcast. One of the ushers, can you direct you to those locations? So we have a new script here. So. Our UU principles begin with our pledge to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of all people. As we are a welcoming congregation, we welcome into our community people of all races, sexual orientations, belief systems, and ages, including any who are fidgety and create youthful noises. 
These little humans represent our future and are welcome in our meeting house. So uh, I have a couple of announcements. One is that uh, following the service, actually about noon, the membership committee will be holding a new UU discussion. This is targeted for uh, folks that maybe have been coming here a while and are interested in becoming full members, members here, and we present some information and answer questions. So it's today uh, at about noon for uh, an hour or two down in the March Brown Room. Uh, even if you haven't already uh, you know, signed up for this, you're welcome to walk in and join us. And I have an announcement from, from Paul Denowitz. Come on up, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, instead of um, Tom Edith, you get me today beating on you, saying the auction is going to be November 10th. It's probably our biggest and most enjoyable event of the year. Um, we have food and we have a lot of uh, enjoyable parties and times and to last us throughout the year. So um, Tom is going to be registering downstairs um, for people that are going to attend. And it would be $20 currently, and that includes dinner and drink. And um, then we'll have a silent auction as well. And um, so please plan on joining us November 10th. It'll be at 5.30 here at church. And um, we'll look forward to a great time. The theme is Once Upon a Time. So plan your costumes accordingly and or no costumes are required. So, so don't feel pressure that way. And um, let me see, what else was I going to say? It's, uh, it we'll have baskets downstairs for the committees um, that will, you can uh, put your raffle tickets in. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you on November 10th. Thank you. I have one little thing to add about the auction. If there's anyone that would like to attend and um, for whatever reason this year needs a scholarship um, uh, as far as a ticket to be confidentially gifted to them, um, just contact me during the week. We've had some generous offers of uh, people buying a couple extra tickets to uh, share with the congregation. Thanks. Okay, just uh, in closing, uh, ask you to please check your order, order of service for other announcements of upcoming events. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to silence your cell phone. Thanks. And reading for the chalice lighting. We light our chalice flame and invite you to come into this place of peace and let its silence heal your spirit. Come into this place of memory and let its history warm your soul. 
Come into this place of prophecy and power and let its visionary light change your heart. I can invite Natalie up. I'd like to invite the children to come up um, to see what Natalie and I have in store today. Come on, we need you. So this morning, we're going to talk about something that I think the adults and the children can think about. I'm going to just get behind you a second. I should have brought the globe over here. So I've got the whole world in my hands, right? Let's see. So does anybody know in here where we live? Can anybody find where we live? Do you know where we live on this big earth? You think, oh yeah. Aren't we lucky to live in that place that's easy to find with the water all around it? Well, way on the other side of the world, woo, way over here in these islands, there's some special people that are called the Maori people. And the Maori people, they're very cool. They tell stories to each other. Like, you know, when you get together for breakfast, they tell stories to each other. Whoa, and they have lots of tattoos. And the, the tattoos tell stories, too. But one thing that they do is when they go visit each other, instead of bringing flowers or candy, they bring a song to one another. So each family or each individual would have a song that would, they would bring when they're visiting somebody. So Natalie has some words from a long time ago friend. And this, so it's written by um, somebody from the First Nations and they have beautiful names, but I, I can't say them. They have the American names written here. So James Dumont and Martin. But what they have to say on this subject is, sing our beautiful song so that we might dance to their melody in the sky world. Give voice to our most sacred teachings so that we might hear the knowledge of the star world. Savor the deepest love of life so that we might feel the throb at the heart of the universe. Love and cherish your relatives around you so that we might sense to the embrace of loved ones. And when you touch life, touch it deeply so that we will feel through your fingertips the memories of the beautiful earth. So can any of the kids up here, do you and any of you have a favorite song? Even if it's a song that, you know, somebody sings on the radio. Do you have a favorite song? Do you have a favorite song? Oh, that's, that's nice. And I bet Happy Birthday is a favorite song, right? Well, Natalie and I are going to teach you a favorite song that you already know, but this could be the easiest song. So if somebody gave you free tickets to go visit the Maori people, this could be everyone's song, right? You all know it, so you can help sing it. Look, at this is a clue. <sighs> this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. So, and we're all going to sing when you go off to Sunday school, this song that says, now let us sing, 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 now let us sing, 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 sing. And it goes on and on. So whichever part you choose, it's going to be fine. And it's number 368. Who's carrying the chalice today? You want to carry the chalice today? All right. Turn it on and you can carry it. <laughs> All right, they're going to follow you wherever you go. We're ready. <laughs>
Okay. Please join me uh, in the litany of gathering that's in your order of service. I think it's a new one, so you're probably not familiar with it. Infinite Spirit, sometimes called Grandfather, Grandmother, Father Sky, Earth Mother, Creator, we gather to praise your creation, to honor the swimmers and crawlers, the four-legged and the winged ones. We give thanks for the beauty and glory of creation and open our hearts to new ways to understand our place in the universe, not the center or focus, but a humble and balanced place where every step we take becomes a prayer, where every word we say makes harmony with the vast vibrating cosmos and where we know we are singing the song of life. We pray to know more deeply that we are in the garden where every plant and animal and speck of in it is a living prayer. Without our brothers and sisters of the plant and animal and mineral kingdoms, the whole family would end. So we want to bless them as they bless us. We pray for humility, not to humble ourselves before presidents or priests, but before the ants and trees. For if we cannot be in true religion to the ant, we shall be outcast of the garden. Let us cast the pollution from our eyes so we can see the glory and live with thanksgiving. Great Spirit, let us remember it is not how we talk, but how we walk. When we say we love animals, let us protect them. When we say that we love the plant people, let us honor them by living lightly on the earth. When we say we love the minerals, let us use them only in necessity and remember their rightful places. Oil belongs in the ground, not in the air, th through our wasteful machines. One to us trees, breathing life into the atmosphere. They are gifts of fire and shelter, fruit and sailing are precious to us. And in many ways you offer us leaves of knowledge. May the vision of mutual interrelatedness, cosmic interdependence, the seamless process of generations, not end in coughed-filled skies blotting the sun, but rather may clear air and healthy forests, wholesome water, expansive prairie and pungent earth nourish paths for all creatures through mountain and valley and the salt sea and through a protective atmosphere as we rejoice in the inhabitants. Hear and empower our mantra. Reduce, reuse, recycle. With thanks for the surprise and mystery of it all, we pray in the name of the Creator, the processes and the presence, and all our relations. Now please join me in reading the words of offering in your order of service. The generous resources of our congregation includes time and financial gifts your contributions support the work, actions, and programming. With humility and responsibility, they are received. As we share a time of multiplying joys and lessening your burdens, we invite you to come up to the microphone, introduce yourself by first name if you have a joy or a sorrow that you would like to share. A perfect heart is one that has known love and loss, joy and sorrow. The perfect heart is one that has been shared.
So I have a couple of things to add to Joyce and Sorrows. Um, on October 6th in 1998, many of you remember this story. Matthew Shepard was left for dead on a fence overlooking the wine in Laramie, Wyoming. He was only 21 years old, and he died six days later. That was the beginning of realizing just how far bullying can go in the gay and lesbian community. And now we have moved to accepting and understanding the awareness of the whole spectrum of gender. Some of you might think, well, Leonetta, why are you bringing this up? Um, six years ago was a long time. Believe me, I'm going to address something more current in a second um, that we have on our minds. Um, but just last night in Auburn Hills, some of you might have heard um, about this story. And it was a situation where um, kids were um, just uh, leaving a steak and shake. And down, they were driving out of the Steak and Shake, and somebody, a car um, with two other um, people, drove by them and shouted a lot of obscenities that I'm not going to go through, but accusing them of being gay and um, screaming at them um, and threatening them. And so we're in a place. We're in a place that you're going to hear more about this in the sermon. We're in a place that sometimes you say, well, Leonetta, we come to church on Sunday because we want to feel good. But Unitarian Universalists are different, in my opinion, than any other group of people that practice their faith because they know that feeling good means feeling relevant and taking actions when actions need to be taken. Feeling good means that we address the realities and the... Siri is not able to do that, unfortunately. So I don't know what she thinks I'm asking her to do, but unfortunately, she wasn't in the order of service, so she's not going to participate. So whatever we choose to focus on from worldwide events, from the 1,700 people that have died in Indonesia in the past couple of weeks because of tsunamis and earthquakes, to the seven people in Haiti that have died. We look at the whole globe. You know, we were saying this little light of mine, all around the world, you're going to let it shine. And you let it shine in that part of the world that you're in. And so I am going to read this poem from Reverend Lynn Unger. She's a a minister and a poet, but we've had, some of us have had a, a rough couple of weeks. Some of us are not happy with what we're seeing in the news. Some of us are maybe smarter than the rest of us and don't even know what I'm talking about because they don't watch the news anymore. They're not willing to give away their blood pressure to something that comes out in a box. But this was written by um, Reverend Lynn Unger in response um, to what has been going on with um, the Ford Kavanaugh process. Lovely way to put it. You say you want a revolution, and who could argue with that? Bad is avalanching into worse, and we, many of us, are in the path. But don't buy a gun. The people you would be fighting already have bigger guns and more will to shoot them. Don't bother arming yourself. She suggests to disarm yourself. Disarm yourself of assumptions of how your brittle belief that you know how things should be. Disarm yourself of expectations because there will be times you will be wrong. Disarm yourself of the need for comfort, so go lightly into places where you are a stranger, and then disarm yourself of loyalty to what you think is normal, but false. Pledge allegiance to a tree outside your window, to your neighbor's children, to the speed of light, to fishing for salmon. 
Fill your arms with fruit and with flowers, with a dog or a cat or a flower or a lover or a mug of tea. Fill your body with singing and dancing or the scent of bay trees in the rain. Empty your world of all that fails to serve the revolution, that fails the test of the seventh generation. Commit to the revolution and I promise we will win. Not, of course, that everything is going to be fine. It never is. Revolution isn't the same as victory. Revolution is the turning of a wheel whose essence is change. Each of you are part of the change. Each of you will do your interpretation. Each of you pick yourself up again and decide which song you will sing to your neighbors and your friends and decide what you will support and know that being a Unitarian Universalist means that, of course, we comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. May all of us be just a little twigged because we were so comfortable that we needed a little bit more of a push. I light this candle for all of those thoughts and those prayers and those wishes and those joys that have not been spoken but will be shared in the community when we meet and greet each other during coffee hour. If you would please turn to, again, in the hymnal that is teal, to 1031. And Diana is going to help us with this, but it's slow and um, it's kind of chant-like. 1031. So many of us remember being taught about Christopher Columbus and the great discovery of America. And one of the poems um, that some of you might have memorized was, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He had three ch ships and left from Spain. He sailed through sunshine, wind, and rain. He sailed by night. He sailed by day. He used the stars to find his way. A compass also helped him know how to find the way to go. Ninety sailors were on board. Some worked while others snored. <laughs> then the workers went to sleep. The others watched the ocean deep. Day after day, they looked for land. They dreamed of trees and rock and sand. October 12th, their dream came true. You never saw a happier crew. Indians, Indians! Columbus cried. His heart was filled with joyful pride. But India, the land was not. It was the Bahamas, and it was hot. The natives were very nice. They gave the 
sailors, food and spice Columbus sailed on to find some gold to bring back home as he'd been told. He made the trip again and again, trading gold to bring to Spain the first American, no, not quite, but Columbus was brave and he was bright. It's nice that we ended on a positive note for the poor guy. Everything gets rewritten, right? Most recently, the European explorer Christopher Columbus, who represents what some say and as we interpret now, the violent history of colonization in the Western Hemisphere to many. Now we see it from a different perspective. As a side note, a very dramatic description of this colonization can be seen, and I strongly recommend you looking at this up on Netflix. In the Adams Family 2, part two, when the socially aware uh, daughter named Wednesday takes over the Columbus Day Parade at her school and gives the real definition of what happens when Columbus went on his voyage. In recent years, we have come to respect the rights and the customs of the First Nations people who are already living in the Americas. In fact, if you're still referring to them as Native American Indians, hopefully you're not, and you go to the trouble of calling them First Nations. The holiday of this indigenous day was first changed in South Dakota, where in 1989, Lynn Hart, working with the governor, put in place a resolution that the second Monday of October as indigenous day as the beginning of the year of reconciliation in 1990. It was instituted then in Berkeley, California in 1992, coincided with the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Columbus in the Americas in 1492. The Indigenous Peoples Day was first celebrated on October 12th in 1992. Indigenous describes people that are living and practicing customs and rituals that are reflective of the natural seasons and have a special connection to a particular place of origin. When we were at the UU Church in London, Ontario, Canada last week, many people were wearing orange shirts. This is usually celebrated the last Friday of September and it is a gesture of asking for forgiveness for all the harm that has been done to the school-aged children by taking First Nations children to Canadian schools and teaching them a different version of their history that did not include the First Nations interpretation. As Unitarian Universalists, we continue to widen our faith umbrella to include Earth-centered faith practices these range from Celtic neo-pagan to Australian aboriginal to First Nations to Maori and Hawaiian earth-centered religions. The coven of Unitarian Universalist pagans was officially included as a faith group at the UU General Assembly in the mid-1980s that brought in rich traditions of connections and deep responsibility to the sustainability of our planet. So, I'm going to pause for a minute because I wanna ask you a question. This is kind of a working question for all of you. Just as this morning I asked you what would be your song, I'm going to ask you today, given everything that's happened in your life, whatever that is, in the last couple of weeks. What would have been your message for today? Because I'm just going to peel back the curtain into a minister's uh, process, if you will. I won't be dramatic and call it angst, but sometimes it is angst. Sometimes we are weighing out things. I look at the calendar a month ago and I write up um, this description about Indigenous Day that is so important. And then big events happen in the news. And then there's tsunamis. There's tsunamis in Indonesia, and then there's tsunamis that come out of our telephones, and there's tsunamis that we get caught up in. And some of us try to put it at bay, and some of us like to 
put it in different compartments. We're at church, let's sing nice songs and be nice to each other. Then we go home and, you know, um, have a glass of wine and turn on the news or the football game and whatever else happens. And then we deal with our family and whatever else happens. So what would have been your message today? So my message today is about Christopher Columbus and changing it to Indigenous Peoples Day and pointing out some of the similarities that the Earth-centered religions have. And then by some sort of twisted magic that happens in my mind, all of it starts coming back and connecting to each other. So what happened when Christopher Columbus landed? What was the story that kept getting retold? In which story, this truly is only hitting me now, which story did we believe? For 500 years, which story did we believe? We believed the story of the survivors, the conquerors. We believed the story of the scribe. We believed the story that had the most power and made Christopher Columbus into a superhero. That's the story we believed. Today, we also wonder which story will be believed. I'll come back to that. So what do um, earth-centered religions have in common? A reverence for the earth, incorporation of metaphors that bring earth, plant, animal, and minerals to life using sensory experiences. Don't we all need a little bit more of that? We're all challenged here in Michigan for the next few months. We all have to hold on to each other tightly and remember that there's still a world outside even if it gets colder and colder and stay connected somehow to nature even if we bring it indoors because we need that connection of people reminding, reminding ourselves that we are not just machines that go through things, but we are truly connected to the food we eat and the animals we care for and the temperatures that swirl around us. So earth-centered religions also have a reverence for all people and animals and plants in the community. I don't know if some of you are familiar with this beautiful book. It's called The Kin of Ada. And so in the book, The Kin Vada, um, the families uh, um, are you know, more communal, and so maybe there would be 30 in any given group, and they wake up and they go over to the fire and they uh, get their beverage, and they share their dreams. What dream did they have last night? This is one of Alice Walker's favorite books, and I've always loved it. And so what it comes down to is that your dream and your interpretation of your dream is important. And as the book goes on, what really happens is that the dream world is the real world. And this stuff that we do and get um, boggled and worried about is just the mundane life that we have to go through so that we can go to sleep and have the dream and then the interpretation shared with the whole group. And so those kind of rituals, rituals that engage humans on levels that include our intellect and our compassion, our intuition, and then our responsibility, much like our friends, the Unitarian Transcendentalist of the early 1900s. So invitations into experiences that transcend our daily experiences of navigating through the day, including blessings with sage, fasting, walkabouts, vision quests, drumming, silences, sweat lodges, honoring the directions and the power of the forces of nature. So many of you worked on this land this year you worked on this land and you, you moved trees and you moved dirt and we had to bring in some other kind of dirt because our dirt wasn't the right kind of dirt. There's more than one kind of dirt. Talk to George if you want to know all the kinds of dirt that he had to deal with and discuss. And we had to buy, we had to buy dirt sometimes. And then the path, the path, raise your hand. How many of you have been on the path within the last six months? 
I invite the rest of you to visit the path. It looks lovely. Part of it is coated now with all kinds of wood and chippings that the people have been working on in this congregation. And so, no, if you ask them if they were um, First Nations, no, we're not First Nations. We're Unitarians. We're Unitarian Universalists. Yes, of course you are. And you're connected to the earth. Now, the only thing that was missing, and uh, I wish we could go back in time, and I can see a couple people that would have loved to participate in this. Every time a tree was cut down, we would have embraced it and gave it a blessing and thanked it before it was toppled because it has served us for so long on this land. And so that connection to the land is important. Some of you wonder where all of these things come from and where they show up. And once you start thinking about earth-centered um, religions, you'll see it show up in collective tribes, in different movies, etc. Remember the Blue People movie, the Avatar movie? How many of you saw that? Okay, well, I'm doing about 35% here. But anyway, it's in a different dimension, and all the people are blue, but one of the high priestesses dies, and they get together after she dies, and they do a memorial chant and blessing, the entire collective tribe, and they didn't know why she died, and somebody simply says she died because her pain was larger than she could endure. What a beautiful phrase to remember. What a beautiful phrase to use as we process. Why did somebody die at 30 or somebody die at 20 and somebody else die at 104? Our bodies are fragile. Sometimes they go through pains that we cannot endure. And I'm not going to ask for any more shows of hands because if you didn't see Avatar, you might not have seen the Black Panther movie either. But in the Black Panther movie, the earth-centered religions are alive and well. The village gatherers gather together to celebrate on the cliff when something important is decided. And so the kin, kin of Atta also, and you will have groups of people, and that is the important piece that goes back to the little hymn that we just sang. If I were given a microphone, and let's say I'm 98, and um, I got brave enough to have a couple of tattoos, and it's my last breath, and they'd say, Reverend Leonetta, what was your only, only, only message to move from the I to the we? It's not all about us, just individually. No person is an island. We are truly connected to a collective. And to be connected to a collective and then to move to a place of having humility in that web of life rather than what other people will refer to, we are the stewards. We are the stewards of the web of life. You can interpret what a dolphin is saying. You know the intelligence of a whale. You are a steward. You are a steward over a little cat that you have for nine years that has cancer, but you can't solve or you can't protect. We are not the stewards. We are walking hand in hand. We are part of the web. And so we take in, as Unitarian Universalists, all of it. The smells and the bells. Ah, oh, the bells. There's probably about 45 people in here today. If there were 35, this would sound different. If there were 70, it would sound different. The tone continues. It continues through your soul, and you feel it. And some of you question, there she goes again, why? Why to make a point? It's not just one vibration. It's many vibrations. And for each one of you that shows up, you change the vibration of the collective. 
And so as Leonard Cohen shares, music is the language of emotions. And so sometimes you don't feel emotional about me breaking down what earth-centered spirituality looks like, but sometimes Diana will play a piece of music or the choir will sing and your emotions change. So here we sit as a group of people. What would your message have been today? Would it have been about indigenous people would have been about the voices that get heard and the voices that do not? Would it have been about the processes that we create, some that seem fair and some that don't? Because sometimes processes are put into place in our congregation and in the bigger world to protect people. And sometimes the people that get protected aren't the ones that we think need the protection but the processes continue and you as a we are part of the processes. So as you look at those characteristics and we're going to have, um, we continue to have drumming groups. Margaret Sullivan has um, conducted a drumming group for a year and a spirituality class for a year. Steve Vimmer is going to start a, a, a drumming class. We're going to have a poetry night November 2nd. We're going to have all kinds of opportunities for you to get in touch with that intuitive side that transcends the mundane and sometimes transcends what you see on that fuzzy little screen that sometimes needs to be turned off. I end with these words from a Nobel Prize winner, Aung San Suu Kyi from Burma. The true development of human beings involves much more than just economic growth. At its heart, there must be a sense of empowerment and inner fulfillment. This alone will ensure that human and cultural values remain paramount in a world where political leadership is often synonymous with tyranny and the rule of a narrow elite. This was written over 20 years ago. People's participation in social and political transformation is the central issue of our time. This can be achieved only through the establishment of societies that play human worth about power and liberation above control. In this paradigm, development requires democracy, the genuine empowerment of the people the challenge we now face is for the different nations and peoples of the world to agree on a basic set of human values which will serve as a unifying force in the development of a genuine global community that's where our work continues not just starts there were voices heard and there will continue to be voices heard. And all I can ask you to do is make sure that your voice is among them. So be it. Would you please look at the unison benediction. And what I'd like to say here about this is <clears throat> We all have a choice. Sometimes we have a heavy Sunday. Maybe this was a heavy Sunday. But it can also be an uplifting Sunday because I can share with each one of you is I have such a, a, a wonderful position here, position in this church, but position here to see all of you. Isn't it amazing that in this room you could talk to at least 10 people and know that they were like-minded. I personally don't have any other location where that happens in my life. So to be here is an honor among you, all of you doing the work differently than the one next to you, but under the same umbrella. So therefore, our unison benediction. Beauty is before me, and beauty behind me. Above me and below me hovers the beautiful. I am surrounded by it. I am immersed in it. In my youth, 
I am aware of it. And in my old age, I shall walk quietly the beautiful trail. In beauty, it is begun. In beauty, it is ended. So of course, there's only one word that I would add. I shall not walk quietly the beautiful trail. Don't walk quietly. Let your wisdom show and make it a wonderful, powerful week of healing.